Hello, it's On The Ledge podcast and I'm your host, Jane Perone, which rhymes with funny old crone. Not a joke, just a fact. In this week's show, I'm talking to fellow podcaster, houseplant enthusiast and garden writer Ellen Zakos about Hoyer's plant tattoos and the future of houseplants. Plus, I answer a question about what plants to place next to a heater. Yes, that one's a good challenge. How are you all doing? I do hope you're okay. I'm so tired, my eyes are like burn holes in a blanket, as my mother would say. So I'm hoping for a restful weekend, a bit of repotting perhaps and blasting the aphids off my oxalis triangularis. I'd like to thank Taylor, a.k.a. uh, UCD... I think that's right. Hang on, I'm going to put my glasses on. (laughs) That would help. Uh, Yeah, UCD Plant Doc, a.k.a. Taylor. Thank you for your five-star review. The line of which that jumped out at me was the one, strap yourself in and prepare to have your glabrous hairs blown back. Well, wow, that sounds like the catch line to uh, my <laughs> my forthcoming, I'm being ironic here, action movie featuring me and a load of houseplants. Thank you also to Caro, Rachel and Erin, who all became legends, and to Yehua, who became a crazy plant person. I am getting perilously close to 300 patrons now and I've decided that when I hit that 300 patron target, patrons at all levels from crazy plant person right up to super fan, I'm going to do a patrons only Zoom. So now's a good time to join and then you can join me for that Zoom, which will consist of me doing a bit of a kind of a talk, um, show and tell type thing and then some time for questions. So Back me now, it could only cost you a few pennies a month if you become a crazy plant person and you get to take part in that fantastic opportunity to hang out with me and other fans of the show. Thank you to all of you who've been sending in your Meet the Listener answers and there's still plenty of opportunity to take part. So do drop a line to ontheledgepodcast.gmail.com and Kelly, my wonderful assistant, will send you instructions on what you need to do. All you need is a smartphone. It's as simple as that. Remember that I'm after your questions on orchid rescue. So if you've got a Trixie orchid problem, tell me about it and I will enlist the help of the Black Thumb, aka Terry Richardson, to help answer that question in an upcoming show. Right, that's the preamble out the way. Now it's time to talk to this week's guest, Ellen Zakos. And I make no apologies for the fact that yet again on the show, I'm going on about Hoyas. Here we go. My name is Ellen Zakos, and mostly what I speak and write about these days is wild edible plants. But I came to plants and gardening via Hoyas and houseplants because I lived in a tiny New York City apartment. I had no garden of my own and I was a beginning gardener and Hoyas were the perfect houseplant. You, it took no talent whatsoever to grow them, at least the beginning ones. And as I fell in love with them and grew more and more, I think I, I came to be growing about 200 different species at one time. Wow. Well, uh, there are many reasons why I asked you to be a guest on on the ledge, Ellen, and the Hoyas were just one of them, but they were a major part uh, because uh, we, we share a mutual admiration for these plants. They are fantastic. And we'll get into a bit of that as we go. You are the co-host of a wonderful plant podcast, a gardening podcast, I should say, or how do you know how you describe it? Because actually it's a bit wider than gardening, Plant Rama. Can you tell us a bit about Plant Rama? Plant Rama is a podcast that I do with C.L. Fornari, who is a longtime friend and colleague at, at GardenCom, which is the American Association for Garden Communicators. Well, it's actually Garden Communicators International. We do a podcast and and we, we don't call it a garden podcast, although there's a lot of gardening in there. We do call it a plant podcast because a lot of people these days um, consider themselves plant people as opposed to garden people. I don't care what you call yourself. If you love plants, then you're my people. And that's all that's important to me. But we we do say it's a podcast for anybody who has ever grown, eaten, or wondered about a plant. 
Well, and that is really all of us, isn't it? Which is a, which is a great <laughs> yes. uh, audience segment. I love that idea of taking down this false wall between food and gardening because, you know, and this is perpetuated by the media because, you know, you get cooking shows and you get gardening shows and in magazines and newspapers, you get gardening sections and cooking sections and rarely do they interact in a way that's useful. Whereas, in fact, if you've ever tried to grow or forage anything, you kind of want to know what, how to harvest it, what to do with it, how to store it. Et yeah, yeah. The two, the two subjects are intimately uh, entwined. You really can't have one without the other unless you are so divorced from your food source that all you do is just, you know, go to the market and pick up something in plastic. But anybody who has ever grown or foraged for something knows how important it is to understand how that plant grows as well as how you can eat it. Now, how long has Plant robbing Rama been going? I think it's at least a couple of years. I'm tr- I'm probably completely wrong and underestimating that. No, no. We, we're in our fifth year now. We actually started it in February of 2017 to 18, 19, 20, 20. Yeah, so we are officially in our fifth fifth year, just beginning our fifth year. I must have started On The Ledge almost exactly the same time <laughs> because my first episode of On The Ledge was the 28th of February 2017. Wow. So obviously we had this uh, this this cosmic this link, yeah. great idea mm-hmm. of podcasting. And in every episode you do, do you do often houseplants do come up and, and Hoyas are obviously one of your favourites. What I love about the show is the fact that you and CL don't always agree um, does CL like Hoyas as much as you do? I can't remember from the Hoya episode. You didn't. No, I don't think she has a single... I'm trying to think back, you know, because of COVID, I, we usually get together in person several times a year. Mm. Um, we live 2,000 miles apart, but but my family lives close to where she lives, so I, I was able to visit her in the past. And I'm trying to think now, I don't, I don't think she has a single Hoya in her garden. I maybe will have to bring her a cutting or two to... Uh, to <laughs> fix that. Uh, but certainly in the wintertime, we focus a lot on houseplants in our episodes. And in the summertime, we do more with the outdoor garden. It kind of, we, we try and keep it seasonal. I guess one of the lovely things about speaking to you is that like me, I don't think it's uh, rude for me to say that neither of us is probably in the millennial category. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you you uh, look substantially younger than I do, uh, Jane, but I can safely say that I am definitely not in the millennial category. Well, I think it's just probably good lighting. But how do you feel about the the rise of the houseplant in popularity in the lot? Well, probably since our podcast began, it's been exponential. Has it been good for the industry as a whole? I think I think a lot of things have happened. I, first of all, I'm thrilled that houseplants are getting so popular. I have never understood why they weren't popular. I have never understood why somebody would want to have a house without a house plant. In my house, which is a small house, it doesn't have great light. There are plants in every single room because I think that's essential to having a house feel like a home. And I, it's always surprised me that there've been so many outdoor gardeners who are not interested in house plants. I don't get that at all. But I think um, house plants have been rising in popularity for the last couple of years, which is great. And also with COVID, outdoor gardening has risen in popularity a lot. And I'm just hoping that if if and when the world gets back to normal, um, that that interest in growing things both indoors and out stays with us. Because I think it's I think it's a wonderful hobby. I think it 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 lets you nurture things. It's I, I just think there's nothing bad to be said about it. Amen. Well, um, I need to go deeper on Hoyas though. Um, I'm sitting here in my office and I've got probably ooh, a dozen Hoya varieties uh, around me in various places. I think that my prediction for the coming sort of year or so is that Hoyas are going to be the next sort of fever plant after the uh, the uh, Aratia, the Aroids were went crazy. I think Hoyas are beginning to go that way. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. I'm kind of glad that I picked up quite a few Hoyas um, through swaps and things in the last couple of years because things that I've got, I'm now looking at the price of and going... I just wouldn't spend that much money on anything just because I'm I'm a, I'm a thrifty person and I don't mm-hmm. you know drop three figures on a house plant. What is it about Hoyas that you think has caught people's imagination? Is it just that they're just so darn easy? I think it's a combination of things because uh, there are some Hoyas that are a little more temperamental, but there are tons that are very easy. But they're also beautiful and they're also 
versatile. You could grow them in hanging baskets. You can plant them and grow them upright by twining them around a tutor or some kind of bamboo poles. Um, they, they're variegated. They're solid green. The flowers are incredibly fragrant. The leaves can be the size of your baby fingernail or they can be the size of your foot. Um, the, the flowers can be different colors, even though they're mainly in the white and pink family. I, I think they have a lot to recommend them. And they're also very flexible as far as what their lighting needs are. I mean, if you want to get really good bloom, most of them need fairly decent light. But if you're content to just have a very attractive, low maintenance foliage plant, then, you know, they'll survive in light that is far from optimum. So I think there's a lot of reasons um, that people love Hoyas. And I would be thrilled to see them become the next Monstera or the next something else. I think they deserve their time in the spotlight. I agree. They are amazing. And one of the things I love about them, I guess like the Aroids, is that they're just so easy to propagate. And so you can do these wonderful swaps as I've done over the years with fellow growers and end up with these lovely varieties that otherwise you probably wouldn't have been able to afford. Or you learn a lot through those cuttings, don't you? And, and, and raising those particular cuttings. You do, and you feel this sense of accomplishment. I remember when I was just getting started with houseplants, the first time I rooted a cutting, I thought I was insanely talented. Oh my gosh, look what I just did. I made this happen. And of course, now I realize it had very little to do with me and everything to do with the plant. But but being able to propagate something easily, and Hoyas are exceptionally easy to propagate, uh, just makes you feel like you're contributing to the cycle of life somehow. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's your preferred method? Do you just stick them in a glass of water or do you go for one of these more, you know, I keep seeing on Instagram these people with these elaborate prop boxes. I mean, I literally have a, a Tupperware box with some laker in the bottom, damp laker, and they get thrown in there or they get thrown in a glass of water. Wait, with what? Damp laker? Expanded clay pebbles, uh, L-E-C-A, laker. I've never heard of that before. Oh, okay. okay. That, uh, maybe we call it something different here. I don't know. But interesting. I mean, I first used them when I started, when I had my green roof installed, which is above me right now. Um, and that is used as the substrate for that because it's just very, very lightweight. Um, so they are, they're made of clay, but it's like clay that's been kind of like, like popcorn been sort of puffed. I don't know how they do it, but it's it's very lightweight and very porous. And so it's useful for all kinds of houseplant uses because if you're looking for sort of adding air to the soil, it's fantastic. And it, people also use it for propagating. So I've just got a big bin of it in my shed, which I use for all different kinds of things. For something like an epiphyte, you know, a Hoya that really likes to have that good uh, air contact with the root system, that sounds perfect. Yeah, it's really it is really really useful, and it, I think it's becoming really popular with um, houseplant growers here. Maybe slightly different in the US, I'm not sure. And that's just the laziest way of propagating ever, because I open the box about once a month and go, "Oh, what's happening?" and often there's a load of roots. I don't use that way to propagate, but I do use something that's pretty simple. Um, basically, you know how when you look at the vine of the Hoya, you see all those little nubbles that are just waiting to become roots? So when I take a cutting, I will I'll probably let it callous maybe for a day and then wrap it. I'll, I'll get a paper towel wet and squeeze out the water, wrap it around the bottom of the cutting where those you know bumpy bits are. And then I put that in a, a Ziploc bag, inflate it, you know, blow it up with warm air, seal it, and it keeps it moist. And usually within about two or three weeks, roots have started to go through, grow through the paper towel. And then I just take it out and pot it up. The genius part of that is blowing it up because I've never <laughs> thought of doing that. But actually, that's a really good idea because then it means that the cutting is kind of cushioned. Exactly. And, and warm and moist. And you can check it every week it's to see if you need to put in a little more water, but usually you don't. And you can also watch it and it's just a little baggy. So if you need to keep it warm on the top of your refrigerator, which is often the you know warmest part of the house, uh, it's, it's easy to do. I do hope you enjoyed that chat. I'll be back with more Chat with Ellen in a little while. But first, it's time for Question of the Week. This one comes from Rachel, who discovered On the Ledge three weeks ago and has had a mammoth binge and is all caught up. Can that really mean you've listened to 174 episodes, Rachel? Wow. Well, I'm not sure to whether to be impressed or horrified, but thank you very much. 
Rachel's question relates to her windowsills, if I may call them ledges, and an issue that she has with two window ledges that face west, a very good aspect for houseplants. That afternoon sun is lovely, but there's an issue because they both annoyingly have panel heaters below them. And Rachel's wondering if there's anything that can be grown above the inferno. Anything I can hang a bit higher. Any ways to adapt the window ledges? She's worried about that hot air. I don't know exactly what a panel heater is. I think it's probably what I've got here in the office, which is just one of those kind of air, hot air convection heaters that runs off the electric. Is that right? You may occasionally hear a click when I'm recording, and that's usually because that's kicked in, although it does it's quite cold, cool in here normally for the benefit of my cacti. Yes, that's what I do for my plants. So uh, that's on the other side of the room, though, fortunately, away from my plants. So that's not an issue for me, but clearly it's an issue for Rachel. So what can she do? I think that you could get away with snake plants. Snake plants are very, very tough and they can deal with hot blasts of heat. If they're getting a lot of sun, it shouldn't cause too much of a problem. What you might be able to do, I think you can buy these certainly in the UK, is buy some fittings that fit over the top of your panel heater and direct the hot air away from, the, stop it from going straight up and send it into the room. That might be worth looking at, provided you get something that's obviously safe and fits properly onto the heater, to redirect those blasts of hot air into the room, which is where you need it, to be honest, rather than at the plants directly. But if you are going to have plants on there, Snake plants, I think, would be a good choice. They are just so tough. Do keep an eye on them. And if you've got any plants that seem to be affected, then you might want to have a program of switching plants in and out of that window to deal with it. The other thing you can do, obviously, as you've said, is have plants hanging higher up, which will probably be less affected by that hot air. There are different systems you can use to hang plants. Sometimes people install curtain rails inside the window, depends exactly what kind of configuration of window you've got. You can also get those telescopic shower rails that people uh, use to hang plants from. I'm always very wary because I have been there when these things have collapsed and yeah, it's not pretty. So make sure that it's very securely attached, whatever you are going to use. Because plants in pots are heavy, especially when they are full of water. Uh, things like Hoyas would probably be fine in those hangers because, again, they are tough, tough, tough. They won't mind cold drafts if there's cold drafts higher up in the window, but they'll also be able to cope with the heat. That would be my recommendation. West facing window, maybe something like Hoya Kerii, if you can get hold of one, or classic Hoya Carnosa can deal with all kinds of different conditions. The other thing you can do is you can buy little shelves that will lift the plants up in the windowsill so they're not sitting right above the hot air. Um, I've seen them on, they're usually designed for other things other than plants, for kitchen storage and things, but you can buy those which will lift the plants up just maybe a few centimetres just to get them out of that heat zone. They are worth looking at as well if you can find something that you're aesthetically happy with. And it's also worth saying that if you are the kind of person that rings the changes on what's on your windowsills between the seasons, and it's a good idea to be that person because conditions do really vary throughout the year. So something that's happy there in the winter may well not be happy there with the level of light in the summer and may get frazzled. Then there, there's you've got more variety, really. Then you could have in the summertime, you could use that west facing window for some of the succulents that like a little bit less of the direct sun than others, like the Gasterias and the Horworthias. And while I wouldn't necessarily advise on keeping those there in the winter when they prefer to be kept cooler, they could be happy there when the heating's off in the warmer temperatures of late spring, summer, early autumn. And then in the winter, you could either move your snake plants there or have the windowsill bare just for those months where your heating is on. Depends how much you're using that heater, what kind of temperature your thermostat's set on. There are so many different factors. If you want a plant that you could stick there just year round, as I say, snake plants, 
I always think that a tableau of lots of different types of snake plants, all in kind of either matchy matchy or very different styles of pots and colours of pots looks amazing. It's probably me being biased because I have that very kind of display myself. You could also have something architectural like a double Z plant, Zamioculcus, Zamifolia. Very tough. Not going to be bothered by the heat from the panel heater and just will sit there and look great all year round. Well, I hope that's helpful. And Rachel, if you've got any other comments on that, listeners, that you'd like me to pass on to Rachel, do let me know. And if you've got a question, drop me a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. I can't answer every single question I'm sent. Time is not in my favour in that regard, but I will do my very best to answer as many as I can or direct you to another resource. And if I don't answer your question, do join the Facebook group Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge because there are so many expert listeners there who are able to help with your queries. Right, it's time to get back to my chat with Ellen and there's something we need to talk about. I need to hear about this tattoo. The tattoo began very modestly. I I have a huge collection of um, houseplant books, huge. And, and some of my favorites are the ones from the 30s and 40s that are just illustrated very simply with, with line drawings, black and white line drawings. So there was one that had a picture of just three delicate little Hoya leaves and an umbel of flowers in black and white. And I brought that into a tattoo artist and had him put it on my ankle. And then I thought, well, this is a vining plant. Maybe the vine should grow a little bit. So we extended it in both directions and started to fill it in with color. And it goes now from my big toe on my right foot all the way up to my hip. And I've thought about extending it up and having it come down my shoulder to my wrist, but I, I haven't done anything about that lately. So, it, but it's, it's, I love it. I just think, you know, it, when I see it in the mirror, it reminds me of my favorite plant and it makes me happy. And also if I'm ever killed in a horrific accident, it'll be very easy to identify my body. <laughs> Very true. I mean, I speak as somebody who doesn't even have their ears pierced and has, uh, I mean, I'm I'm not a fan of pain. I don't think I could cope with tattooing pain. And I just, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I doubt I'm ever going to get a tattoo. <laughs> but if I was going to get a tattoo, Hoya would be right up there, top of the list as a, a possible subject. It's definitely painful. I'm not going to lie to you. And I used to, you know, I wrote my first poem when I was nine years old and it was about the trauma of getting a shot at the doctor. So it was not an easy decision for me either, but it, the pain is over and the tattoo is here to stay. So I'm, I'm glad I did it. I mean, I can I can only imagine as somebody with two children that it's like childbirth that, you know, it's horrendous. But once it's over, you quickly forget yes. and you want to have another one. <laughs> Um, so tell me a bit bit about your your fave Hoyas then. Are there particular ones that really excite you? Yes, there are, you know, for many different reasons. I, I got to say, usually I choose my Hoya based on foliage rather than flower. I love the flowers, don't get me wrong, but the foliage is with you all year round. And one of my very favorites is Hoya caudata. I don't know if you know that one. Yes, it's, I do. I just, I love the texture. It's got, you know, most Hoyas have a glossy, smooth surface to them. Um, but the Hoya caudata has that kind of rough, almost bumpy surface. And the variegation is highly irregular with the silvery white and the, and the reddishness to it if it gets into high light. It's a, a medium-sized leaf, I would say, three to four inches long with a very pointy tip. And the leaves are, are loosely spaced around the vine. I just, I love the growth habit of that one. And I think the foliage is gorgeous. And I will say the flowers are also beautiful. Um, very, very deep red in the center and, and kind of hairy and ciliate. Um, it's just it really, if I could only grow one, and I'm glad I don't have to make that choice, I think Hoya caudata would be probably my first choice. I have that as a small cutting, so it hasn't yet flowered, but I agree. The leaves are stunning. They are the... The, just, the overall effect is gorgeous and I can understand why that's becoming a very, very popular Hoya. Uh, any others? Any what's, what's in the top three? Oh, okay. So I think next would be Hoya Vitalina. Do you know that one? Mm -hmm. um, that one has large leaves. I mean, they can be six to eight inches long, a sort of a palish medium green and kind of wavy margins. And when you 
get it in higher light or even a west facing window, the margins take on this sort of reddish purple color. So it looks like each leaf is outlined. And the flowers of that one are a much more subtle blend. It's a white with a very pale pink um, Corolla, but also beautiful, very fragrant. And I just find the leaf shape and the size of that one. It does have a shiny surface. It's a, a waxier looking leaf, um, just gorgeous. Gorgeous. I highly recommend that one. That's not one I have. I know that these kind of sun-stressed Hoyas, as they call them, are very in now, aren't they? On Instagram, I'm constantly seeing sort of sun-blushed Hoyas as being the thing to, to go for, um, which is interesting that that's, I guess... I think the only trouble with that is it sometimes gives people a false expectation of what their plant's going to look like when it arrives. Yes, and 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 some of them, like Merrily, well, there's a bunch of them that will get really, really intense red variegation um, when they are in high sunlight. And I would say Vitalina is not like that. Vitalina keeps its outline um, along the leaf margin all the time, but it'll become a little bit darker, but it doesn't need to be like an outdoor full sun. It'll do that even in a Western window. Uh, but you're right. I think when people see photos of these very dramatic red leaves, if they get their cutting and it doesn't look like that, they're bound to be dis disappointed. So whoever's selling them needs to manage the expectations, I think. <laughs> Indeed. And have we got one more to add to this top three? We have like 10 more, but I'll, if I... Oh, yeah, if, well, okay. I So it's like choosing children or choosing, you know, best friends. Like, who do you pick? Yeah, it's very difficult. Um, I'm going to go with one that's very different. I really love Hoya Curtisai. Do you grow that one? Yes, I find that really hard. It's a tricky one, but I'll tell you why uh, what worked for me and and why I think it works. Um, first of all, it's it's a miniature, so it's the opposite of Vitalina. You know, the leaves are tiny; they're sort of spade shaped, and they're very generously speckled with this silver white variegation. I think it needs cooler temperatures at night to be happy. Um, and I, in where I used to live in Pennsylvania we had these large um, bay windows and it was a cold place. And if I kept my Hoyas that needed that nighttime temperature drop in those windows, it just kind of miraculously gave them exactly what they needed. But if you, if you can't give them that temperature drop, then, then Curtis I and a couple of the other ones like Ratusa, Bella, those guys, those really need the cooler temperatures at night. Well, mine is here in the office, which does get cool at night. So I'm hoping, I mean, it's okay. It was just a very tiny cutting that I was given and it's just so slow and you just kind of looking at it going, come on, <laughs> but it hasn't sort of, then I've had Hoyas like that before where I've had a, a single leaf and then they've suddenly exploded into life and really started to grow fast. So I think hopefully it's just a question of getting established, getting really good root network established and then it will go we'll see but you're right that's another there are so many to choose from I mean is there one if somebody's listening to this thinking oh wow I haven't as often happens I'm sure it's the same with your podcast people listen and then realize they need to add to their wish list mm -hmm. is there a particular Hoyer I mean is it the classic Carnosa that beginners should be going for I think I think the Carnosa is a good one because it's it's so readily available but I would suggest starting with Puba Calyx instead it's also almost as readily available as Carnosa and I love it I just think it's it's a, a I think it's a more beautiful leaf the green with the flecks of silver or pink and I think the flower is more beautifully fragrant and I feel like the growth habit on that one is more attractive either it's it's very elegant uh, I, I don't know. I just, it's one of the first ones that I ever grew and it's still one of my favorites, I think for both foliage and flower and for ease of growth. And the nice thing is about Puba Calyx and Carnosa, they can both take it down pretty cold if you have a drafty window. So even in the winter time, I don't know how cold it gets where you are, but you know, we, we get below zero here. And if a Carnosa or a Puba Calyx is in a window that gets down to 45 or 50 degrees, it's going to be totally fine. So I think those are both good ones to start with, especially for someone who's beginning with Hoyas, but Puba Calyx would, would be my first choice. And it's pretty easy to find in the market. Yeah, I think that's a great recommendation. What was your first Hoya? I'm just wondering, what, what got you hooked? Carnosa, Crimson Princess mm -hmm. was my first one years ago, and I've still got the plant. I nearly lost it because I allowed a big stem that was completely white to grow. 
and this was you know before I really realized and um and then I remember I had um I had Doug um Doug Chamberlain the Vermont Hoyers guy on the podcast and I was like is this why my this was a few years after it happened is this why my Hoyer nearly died and he's like probably <laughs> and so I managed to save two cuttings of it and it's fine now it's it's romping back up and that's what's so brilliant about them is you can if it, I always say to people if your plant's looking a bit dodgy do take some cuttings because this could be your little sort of escape Cash. yes uh, ship which can take you but but yeah, so that was my first one, which I had for many years and is still going strong, thankfully, after after recovering from that. And then I got a massive sort of mother load of cuttings from a guy um, in Scandinavia a few years ago, which then kind of exploded. Was that my Anders? Collection. Anders Venstrom? No, it's Tommy Tonsberg, um, who's been on the show also, um, who was coming over to Chelsea. Back in the days when we could do things, um, he was helping at a Chelsea stand. And I think probably my favourite of those, and I haven't actually totally confirmed the identity of this one, but I would say it's probably Velosa. I don't know if you've, have you grown Velosa? It is a beast. It's I don't think I have grown Velosa. I've seen it and it's beautiful, but I have not grown it. Well, the other one that I've seen, that the, the other identification that I've kind of potentially made is it also looks like a cultivar called Welsh Mountain Zoo, which is a very obscure name. But anyway, whatever this Hoya is, it is a complete beast. And you're right about the differences between different Hoyas. Some of them are like, you know, t these wiry, tiny wiry stems. This one is meaty. Like it's really substantial. And it's just, it just romps away. Like is it thick stems like Hoya Keri, the heart-shaped leaf one? Because... But they're very, they're very softly furry. They're, they're just covered in these soft hairs. And it just, it gives you a vibe of like, I can't really describe it, but it, it, it does, it, I just call it the beast because it is just so, <laughs> and I keep, people always want cuttings of it and I'm always taking cuttings. So it's still it, relatively small, but it just, it's a, yeah. It, and the leaves of these got that amazing venation that you get on some Hoyas where you've got paler areas. Yeah, now I, now I want that one. Yeah, sorry, I can't send you a cutting, but um, it is a lovely, it, it's a lovely Hoya. And I, it's never, I don't think it's a big flowerer. I don't think, it hasn't flowered for me and I don't think it flowers very readily. But yeah, it's it's great. It's really, really lovely. And I, I just love those kind of plants that are just so kind of vibrant and full of vitality and they're just going for it. It's kind of exciting as opposed to the ones where you're kind of like, please stay alive. And they're so fragile. <laughs> um one thing that i'm doing on the show and i do every spring is um a sew along where i'm sort of encouraging listeners to sow house plants from seed and one of the things i'm actually doing this year is growing hoya serpanes from seed which wow was sent to me by a listener um, but but the trouble with Hoyas is, of course, that you have to sow the seed incredibly fresh. But have you ever tried sowing any houseplants from seed? Is that something you've got into? No, it ne I never have. And I know, especially with Hoyas and with everything in, in you know, all of the Asclepiads, the, the, the seeds are not viable for very long. So you really do have to sow them quickly. I have never been a seed grower for several reasons. First of all, in my tiny little New York apartment, there was no room for sowing from seeds. It, it was it was one room. It was 400 square feet with a husband and two cats. And so there was no seed sowing going on. Um, and when we moved, when we bought a house in Pennsylvania, we were only there on the weekends. And it was very difficult to take care of your seeds if you were away for five to seven days at a time. So there was that. And then maybe you could also say that I'm just too lazy to grow from seed. And I, I'm not a lazy person in general, but, but it's just not something I've ever done a lot of. I would be very interested, though, in hearing if you're, um, you said serpents you were growing from seed? Yeah, I mean, they're doing really well. And I was really panicking because the lovely, lovely listener that sent them to me, who has sent me plants in the past, she said, oh, you know, do sow them fresh. And she sent them to me at Christmas. And inevitably, partly because of, you know, homeschooling at the moment and all kinds of things that are getting in mm -hmm. my way of work, I hadn't sowed them and I felt terrible. And I left them for about two or three weeks. And I thought, and I, I sort of said, she said, how are the seeds getting on? I was like, ah, I oh. haven't sowed them yet. <laughs> anyway, they did, uh, they did germinate very nicely. And I've got about 15 
tiny little seedlings. Um, so that's really exciting. And that's exciting. That's so exciting. Yeah, and that's the thrill I get from growing from seed. I think in, as I get older, I've kind of learned that I tend to have this habit of sowing a lot of things and going mad and then realising I just can't maintain it all. I always used to do this with tomatoes, um, just growing like 15 varieties of tomatoes and then realising I haven't got enough room to keep these somewhere until they can go outside in the end of May. So, yes, it's it's a challenge. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit more about what the houseplant culture is like where you are in New Mexico. Uh, is the climate such that you're chucking a lot of your houseplants outside come summer or is it too, too sunny? Well, both, actually. I do put my plants outside every summer, but what I do is I... It's not a very... It doesn't seem elaborate to me. It might seem elaborate to somebody who was not you know, in love with houseplants, but the sun here is so bright. We are at 7,000 feet. So, um, the sun is really hot and it's really bright and it would be, they would just burn up if I didn't protect them. So what I do is I put out two step ladders on the shady side of the house and I run boards through the steps. And then I put, I put the plants on the boards, hang some of them, let some of them sit. And then I, I staple, <laughs> I have a, a sheet, which I staple to the fence and I put over the top of the step ladders. I, you know what? I'm going to send you a photo of this. You said you wanted photos. I'm going to send, I'm going to send you a photo of my setup. So it, it gets, um, it's a light colored sheet. So it does get some light, but it protects everything from the burning hot sun. And that way I can give my plants the summer vacation outdoors, but, but they don't get scorched, but that's extremely important here. When, when I was in Pennsylvania, all I did was I would just gradually get them used to the sunlight over a period of like four or five days, the way you'd harden off seedlings and then, um, and then just space them around the garden, some hanging from tree branches, some in the shade of a tree, but it was much easier there because the sun wasn't nearly as fierce. Yeah, that is the factor. I think people just don't realize the difference in the strength of light anywhere indoors compared to outside. And then obviously exactly. exponentially so where you are in New Mexico, it's going to be really sunny. Is it the case that sort of succulents are so kind of everywhere that they're not particularly prized as houseplants? Like everyone's like, oh, yeah, there's a giant agave. And <laughs> I mean, that's what I imagine. I've not been to New Mexico, so I'm just my, giving you my terrible English stereotypes of what it would be like, but no, that's okay because we. <laughs> I have my terrible English stereotypes of you know the lush Gertrude Jekyll gardens or whatever oh, you know. So oh, that's what it looks like just <laughs> yes, out here. I'm no, sure it there's is. No mud bath from my dog <laughs> on the lawn or anything. <laughs> but um, you know, we, the succulents are extremely popular here outside because we get so little rain. I mean, back east we had an average of let's say 45 inches of rain in a year, and here we're lucky if we get 10 to 15. So it's a completely different plant palette, and succulents are very popular as garden plants. But um, but they're not the same succulents that you would grow indoors because these are succulents that require winter dormancy. Uh, so, so yes, there's a lot of cacti, a lot of succulents in the landscape, but, but they're very different from our houseplant succulents. And are you a succulent fan other than, I mean, I never quite get where the Hoyas are classed as succulents. Are they semi-succulents? I mean, all these divisions seem a bit arbitrary. But are you into things other than Hoyas in the succulent line? I think, so, you know, technically speaking, I think that whether something is succulent or not may have to do with um, the kind of photosynthesis that it performs. It's been a long time since I took a botany class, but I remember that the CAD-CAM photosynthesis cycle uh, is what the really, truly succulent Hoyas do, and that's when they um, open up their stomata at night, when they're less likely to lose moisture. And there are some uh, Pachyclata, Hoya Pachyclata, that that is one Hoya that is considered a true succulent. But then you have um, some like multiflora with really thin leaves, which I would say is not succulent at all. But uh, most of them I would put in the semi-succulent range. And, and that's great for houseplant growers because it means they don't require watering every, you know, three to five days. And they're, they're going to have some reserves to draw on if you go away on vacation or if you just forget or get too busy. Yeah, exactly. Which, you know, is, I mean, I don't know about you. I sort of 
tell people how to water their plants, but I do have to admit that oftentimes it's me flinging water as I pass by at a plant that's looking desperately thirsty <laughs> because I haven't watered it. I mean, uh, I guess we all we we can probably divide growers into like the people who want to water constantly and the people who don't water enough, and I'm definitely the latter. But, <laughs> that's uh, that's why I grow the house plants that I grow. I'm looking now at several Sansevierias, some really drought tolerant orchids, a couple of Aspidistras. If it if it requires, you know, constant care, it doesn't grow in my house because as much as I love houseplants, I have other things to do in life. I uh, agree totally. And let's just finish off with a small amount of crystal ball gazing. Can you, with your vast knowledge of houseplants and, you know, <laughs> history with them and doing plant Roma, can you sort of see where houseplants are going? Do you think this explosion of interest is going to continue or will it, will it, is it going to ever inevitably going to be a bit cyclical? I think everything is is cyclical. I really do. But I hope that the wave of popularity that houseplants are enjoying right now, I hope it's with us for a while. And and I think it will be. I I don't, my crystal ball is not always very accurate, but I think houseplants are here to stay because they're just so rewarding. And I think what it needed was for people who are enthusiastic about it to reach critical mass. And now that they now that the numbers are great enough and people are are supplying more interesting house plants and the the availability is there and the prices are are well sometimes the prices are insane but sometimes they're not and i think i think it's going to continue to to grow in popularity as a subject for 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 years i hope i really do well thank goodness for that because that secures the future of both our podcasts <laughs> well it's been great to speak to you ellen thank you very much you're very welcome my pleasure jane Thanks so much to my guest, Ellen Zakos. If you are a Patreon subscriber at the Legend or Superfan level, you can hear an Extra Leaf episode with Ellen talking about another aspect of her expertise, which is foraging. And do check out the show notes to this episode at janeperone.com for pictures of the Hoyas we've been talking about and also Ellen's awesome tattoo. And I'd love to know what plant tattoos you have. As you heard in the interview, I am a tattoo refuse Nick, but I love looking at other people's tattoos. So if you've got an awesome plant tattoo, do let me know. That's all for this week. I'll be back next Friday for more leafy badinage. Bye. music you heard in this episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops, Fire Tree by Axle Tree, and Plantation by Jason Shaw. All tracks are licensed under Creative Commons. Visit janeperone.com for details. Mm-hmm.